Hello, everyone, and welcome to this virtual meetup. My name is John Lin. I'm the founder and chief editor at Healthcare IT Today. It's exciting to come together here virtually to have this great discussion, and thanks for everyone that's joining live or watching the recording. If you are watching live, uh, we'd love to have your questions uh, and your interactions, so be sure to submit those through the GoToWebinar control panel, and we'll do our best to incorporate those into our discussion today. We're excited to have Dell Technologies hosting this one, and the topic for today's discussion is how healthcare organizations are integrating virtual chronic care solutions to adjust to the next normal. I think virtual care has become a reality uh, thanks to the pandemic. Uh, you know, it's such a tragic occurrence, but I think from a virtual care perspective, uh, we're seeing just this dramatic adoption. So we're excited to have this discussion today and, and really talk about this next normal. Uh, and I think it's going to be a series of next normals is what we're, we're discovering. So uh, hopefully we can offer some insights. And if you're watching live, definitely send in your questions and be part of the discussion. Also, if you're watching this, you can follow along on Twitter. So be sure to live tweet anything that you hear that's interesting, any questions you have. We'll also be live tweeting it on the Healthcare IT Today Twitter account. I know Dell Technologies will be doing it as well. So there should be a nice uh, back channel discussion for those that are participating live. Um, also, be sure to use the transform HIT hashtag and also use the hashtag HITSM. Uh, I, I bet Jamie would like me to mention there's also a cool hashtag telemed, telemed, now, is, telemed uh, now is also another hashtag that's come together around the telemedicine community. So check all of those out and uh, enjoy your live tweeting. We'll be sure to check them afterwards. You can, you can tell us what you like, what you don't like. Uh, that's my favorite part uh, after the event is to see what people thought of what we said. All right, uh, enough with the logistics. Uh, let's go around and introduce our panel. We'll let each of them introduce themselves. Uh, since we're all gentlemen on this call, Gail, do you want to lead us off? Sure. Hi, Gail Zotz. I am Vice President of Continuum of Care for Centers Healthcare. We are the largest post-acute healthcare system in the state of New York. So always a lot to say lately. Um, I come to, you know, you had asked what our perspectives are, to share our perspectives that we're bringing to this. And it's interesting because I was a CEO of a startup during the internet boom, been in health tech my whole career, and then I took a sideline and I was a chronic uh, care patient myself in palliative and late stage cancer, came out the other side to do really innovative, exciting things in health and technology. And so I think I have a lot of perspectives that I'll be interested to get the chance. Thanks so much for having me. Nice to meet everyone. Thanks, Gal, and uh, we're excited that you bring both a kind of, you know, a multiple a multitude of perspectives, but we especially appreciate that you'll bring a patient perspective. So thanks for joining us. David, you want to go next? Sure. I've uh, been about the healthcare IT consulting business for 25 years. I think this would make my 30th year at HIMSS, actually, uh, if we had had it. And I've got a significant engineering background. Um, you know, Chief Innovation Officer for our Global Healthcare Life Sciences Group, and focus a lot on social innovation, um, which is uh, you know a, a group of projects that feed the, uh, that beat uh, some of the goals we have laid out for social impact. Um, you were working on a precision health uh, enablement platform, we call it PEP, and that's gathering a lot of focus from our customers. And one of the most uh, challenging parts of that is what information do we bring it in? Uh, do we bring in? How do we analyze this? This is kind of what comes af after data lake. I also have a great personal interest in uh, non-communicable diseases um, and kind of have this theme around the brain is the next moonshot, personal experience, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, you know, eating disorders and epilepsy. So when we have topics like this, I'm thinking real world, what I've seen in my family, in my uh, experience with, with family and friends. So delighted to be here um, with, with everyone. I think we all had uh, quite a, bit, a different uh, bit of diversity. Thanks, David. And I think if you watch a HIMSS virtual event, that counts as 30 years. So I, I think let's count it. Jamie, you want to introduce yourself? 
Sure. Jamie Edwards, CEO and co-founder of Cloudbreak Health. Uh, Cloudbreak is a telemedicine company that's in around 1,200 hospitals across the country doing 85,000 encounters a month over over 10,000 video endpoints. And our initial uh, use case was bringing a language interpreter to the point of care for the limited English proficient and deaf and hard of hearing. And then we discovered there were other healthcare disparities to solve. And so we embarked on not only doing telestroke and telepsychiatry, but during COVID launched a telequarantine use case in hospital that was the first telequarantine use case launched that actually helped uh, providers not have to go into the room, uh, therefore reducing PPE and mitigating the risk of infection, uh, infection and trying to lower R0. Prior to this, I ran an ER hospitalist and anesthesia group, so really cut my teeth on the provider side of healthcare. And so uh, as a result of that, really focused on improving you know, provider-centric what I would call strategies in healthcare that help reduce physician burnout and help those, you know, thereby those physicians take better care of their patients. Awesome. Thanks for joining us, Jamie. Pete? Yes. Hello. How you doing? Um, so I'm president and chief operating officer of eCare21. Uh, we're one of the leading virtual care solutions out there. We're partnered with Dell, building an integrated solution. Um, and my career started back with Bell Labs. I'm the technologist uh, that uh, I actually, uh, David, you also go way back as well, probably 30 years. Uh, my career started back in the 90s. I founded a software technology company and developed some network management solutions for the telecom providers. And uh, then I grew the company, sold it, started another company, and in the two, 2000s, uh, built a product uh, that became a leader in networks and security event management, did threat detection across large enterprises. And I'm telling this for a reason, uh, because there's a hook line at the end. And that company was acquired by an audit and compliance company, which then got acquired by IBM. I spent about 11 years at IBM running their global security SWAT team. And that's where all the uh, security experts and hackers uh, basically help customers implement solutions to protect their crown jewels. In 2018, I had one of those infamous meetings over a napkin and an app with the CEO founder of eCare21, and I jumped at the opportunity, left IBM to join this mission because what he was building was essentially what I built in two lifetimes uh, prior, which is a platform for virtual care that puts the patient at the center and engages them with care, circles of care, and connects it to the clinical documentation required to get paid. Physicians need to get paid for doing the work they're doing, and the only way you can do it is have the virtual care encounter documented, and we built a plumbing for billing. So we've built a simplified patient engagement uh, solution with Dell, and now we have the clinical documentation to support the reimbursement, which is going to help. Reimbursement is important because of the revenue stream, but we're providing better care for the patients so you have better outcomes and you reduce your costs on your high-risk patients. That's great. Thanks, Pete. And, uh, you know, we're going to get to that reimbursement question. Uh, we, we have to talk about that. Uh, I think Pete's just excited to talk about how we're going to pay for this. But but kind of before we get there, uh, maybe, David, you can kick us off. You know, what are the key reasons that this shift to virtual care is going to remain? I think we've all seen adoptions happen, but is it going to remain? And what are the reasons it will remain? Sure. So we're you know, some what we're going to talk about today is really the next normal, and I think that's a good way to, to speak about it. But I also want to give us, uh, you know, some challenges to think through the generations of consumers and those who are already engaged in, in specialty care, uh, looking down the barrel of uh, conditions, chronic or life-threatening conditions, and they all have a different experience in the way they engage and get care scheduled and they're gonna, they're gonna get through it. Um, but when you go back and think about the now normal, that tends to be a younger generation, the late millennials, early Zs, and what they, what they want to experience is to do things virtually. Um, if you have specialty care, kind of the parent or the mom or whatever in the middle now, that role has changed. It's gonna be you know stay at home, work from home, care from home, teach at home type of things. So we're going from something where we, we, we in healthcare were laggards on doing digital transformation. We weren't necessarily in a whole focused on the consumer. We kind of had the boxes we, we were in. It took a long time to get specialty care. Primary care was kind of fading away. And where we're in now is like a number of different apps, a number of different portals that people have for access. 
I'm in an organization. I'm lucky enough to have MedHelpline and, you know, Teladoc and some of these tools along with, you know, 100,000 other people. Um, and we're going to figure out how to get through it. But the point is we're going to get through it each in our own way as far as the tools that we have in our desire to go into somewhere versus go through a digital front door or a series of apps. And that's kind of the, the now normal. And you will see um, behaviors, you know, and not wanting to actually drive to places or um, having places, specialty cares uh, not available and all sorts of shifts. And this is what we've seen in other industries have gone from in the other industries, kind of the biz school speak was you get, um, you know, disambiguation of how you you know, how you access services as a consumer, and then you disaggregate the business, and consumers can see where they want to go, and some things go to B, B2B, and then you have this disruption, and this disintermediation, and um, we're skipping over that, and virtual care, because of COVID, uh, is the trigger that will make that happen. So I, my, my thing, there's no going back. We're going to have four or five different patterns of personas of consumers, and we're going to stratify the services delivered um, much around access, particularly access to specialists and those who have to be monitored remotely, whether at home or being tethered. That's great. Peter. I imagine your business has been upended in some ways from all the changes. Do you think that's going to remain post COVID or, or, you know, what, and maybe let's extend the discussion a little and talk about what's still needed to make sure it stays. And, you know, maybe we'll hit you and then we can go to Gail. It's clear that a lot of this has got to stay. Once uh, the genie's out of the bottle is the common phrase, but if you look at the, uh, the sheer size of what's just happened, uh, people's mindsets have changed, the next normal. Essentially, we are here. I heard somebody say it's really the next reality. This is the new reality for a lot of us. And I think that um, it has, in the past, it's been more of a question, uh, how do I get paid? And that question is now getting answered. So the incentives were in place uh, for reimbursement, say Medicare started it, Medicaid is matching. But essentially, the seniors who needed the most care were uh, contributing to the, uh, I, I would say their care was contributing to a large chunk of the healthcare cost. And incentives were being placed so that reimbursement was there. And they were trying to get the, the physicians, the nurses, the qualified healthcare, healthcare professionals to engage in that reimbursement. But technology wasn't available. Now it's available, and as a result of COVID-19, they're now opening up opportunities for telehealth, which went from about 12% engagement to about 80% on the last numbers. But a large number of those solutions, again, are not going to pass the muster when they do ratchet some things back, like HIPAA compliance. That's going to make sense. So uh, I would say half of those uh, off-the-shelf uh, FaceTime-like solutions or even Zoom that are being used today won't pass the HIPAA muster well enough, and they won't have a workflow that's conducive to virtual care. It's just a standalone tab in a browser. You don't have your clinical documentation. You might be using another laptop. The solutions that answer that question, like eCare21, are going to have a voice at the table. So uh, reimbursement is there. It's accessible via technology. And the telehealth solution is actually the tip of the spear to other things that can be provided to introduce virtual care to, uh, to individuals. And they're gonna like the experience because they now have learned, hey, I do really like this telehealth. <laughs> so we have a big pro virtual care panel, I can tell. Do I, I, am I the one that has to throw the wet blanket on here? I mean, I just think that the organizational inertia of how we've always done it is going to come into play here. Uh, so I, I don't, you know, I, I hope you're right, Pete, but uh, you know, I just feel many organizations are gonna say, oh, let's go back to this, and even many patients. But, uh, Gail, I mean, what, what's your take on it? So, you know, I think when we're looking at COVID, we have to look at what did it show us is already true and what was necessary and good health care and good business for the health care. Um, and if anything has changed, perhaps some of the things that we did specifically for the virus may go away. But what was true all along is going to stick. So for those of us doing this, we have been talking patient-centered design and solutions for a long time, the outcomes and how that's been. How long have we been talking about triple aim, 
better patient experience, lower cost, better outcomes, a long time, right? Like that, you hear this from me a lot, John. I believe the tech is a tool. I'm a tech person, but it is a tool to better care. So if we put aside the tool part, what do we know? Chronic patients do not stop being patients. They need care. They're actually sicker right now because they're having episodes because they haven't gotten care during COVID. So we're gonna have to focus even more on chronic care. When we talk about virtual, I'll just add to the mix that it's not only telehealth. Yes, at centers we're doing telehealth. We love telehealth, right? But that is not all that virtual is. To me, the answer is, how do we meet the patients where they need to be met at the time in the way that they need to be met? And what has opened up widely is phone and more, and fax, well not fax so much, but right, emails and internet and um, certainly the video. I think that what I hope to see is we're gonna see more connection with community and home services. So we don't have as many people going into the home right now to support the virtual side. I've been around remote patient monitoring for a long time. I think it's definitely going to grow after this, not uh, go back in the closet. But I think the big thing is workflow, particularly, of course, I look at it as a healthcare provider that to me, again, it's not as much the tech as it is how much are we integrating it into the workflow of delivering quality care. Right. And at centers before COVID was the crisis it was, we were already looking at phone call systems and call banks and connecting with community care and home care and reducing patient readmission. A readmission is a huge issue that has in some ways taken a back seat during COVID that's going to become an even bigger issue. And virtual care is a solution for reducing very expensive, not great quality care, preventable readmissions. So I think it. I think as we calm down into the new normal, we're going to see more adjustment into areas of innovation that were really about delivering higher quality care at lower cost for a better patient experience. That's my hope. Well, I'm glad you brought up readmissions because that is a place where they get paid and there is some money involved. Uh, as many people say, uh, you know, follow the money and you'll understand where it's going. But Jamie, let's extend that discussion and really what is still needed to make sure it stays. Pete argues the reimbursements there. I would argue we still need more from commercial payers. We need to understand how do we reimburse for chronic versus a, a, a one-time incident. But you know, what other things are you seeing that, you know, hey, we could still use this if we want this next normal to be a reality? Yeah, I think uh, there's a few different things. You know, one, we're talking about changing human behavior here. And it's not only changing patient behavior, it's changing provider behavior, administration behavior, right? You're looking at something that there's been a fundamental shock to the system, which is COVID. And, you know, what's going to remain afterwards? And I think if you take a look at some of the things that have been done from a governmental standpoint, the relaxed regulations from a state licensing standpoint have really made a huge difference, right? The fact that a doctor licensed in one state can now freely practice in another state, um, you know, without limitation is something that is a key part of this because what telemedicine does is allow you to really load balance the healthcare system. And so the ability for a doctor in California to treat one in New York, to treat, treat a patient in New York is, is going to be something that should outlast. Uh, and that, by the way, something that was already in progress with the federal medical licensing compact and things of that nature and a lot of states had already signed on to it so seeing things like that stay um, are going to be critically important i also think that we're now seeing the evolution of this argument of privacy versus hipaa and um you know millennials as a group right have already traded a lot of their privacy for convenience ease of use uh, engagement and those types of things so i think we're going to continue to see a lot of that come down um, the pipe from that standpoint. But if you take a look at what's happened, the big thing that's really thrust telemedicine forward to me is that patients are now fearful a little bit of that healthcare environment. And they know that if they go into a facility, they're going to be risking potential for infection. And, you know, to a lot of people, whether rational or not, that is driving some of or most of a lot of the adoption that's happening. But what's happened is patients have really built a lot of muscle memory 
with how to use a telemedicine platform. They've experienced the convenience. Um, they've experienced the fact that they don't need to travel. They don't need to sit in a waiting room. They don't need to go park and way find their, you know, their way through a, through a health system campus. And so I, see, I think what we're seeing is the evolution of the definition of a health system changing and it not being geographically tied anymore, but those four walls of the hospital breaking down now being extended in the community. And so regulation is going to continue to support that move. You know, there are certain things in healthcare that simply make sense. I think people on the call would agree value-based care makes sense. So we're going to continue to move in that direction and away from fee-for-service. Um, and I think telemedicine is one of those things. You think we're moving away, we're moving deeper into value after everything that's happened the past year? I, I, I do think that we are going to be moving deeper into value. And I think you, when you take a look at the tools that we're going to be looking at, you know, telemedicine is one of those things that really helps effectuate even a broader move into value. And, you know, you were say, saying, Gail, that you really espouse this tool approach, which I'm fully supportive of. Um, the fact is, is that telemedicine is just one part of a care continuum. Right. And so when people are talking about population management and those types of things, you take a look at a company like Lavongo as an example, you know, they're helping manage a, a portion of that patient population as part of a broader continuum when it comes to diabetes and things of that nature. So yeah, I think, I think we are over time going to be moving much more into value. It's interesting because New York, if anybody followed, district was not uh, renewed. So five year, $18 billion value, a reorganization stopped a month before COVID. And I wonder between, because I think New York was a leader in moving to value. So that ended. And then we went into COVID where I think that health systems are going to be risk adverse. And so I'm, I'm curious about what we're going to keep from the idea of value, even if value-based payments do not come up. That's where I think telehealth comes in, the idea of long-term care and ongoing patient management versus whether or not we're actually going to get reimbursed that way. That's what I'm asking. And I would add a layer to that, that there, there's kind of this mixed ground that, you know, I think Pete kind of talked about a little, and maybe you can dive into it more. Uh, it, you know, there are a few fee-for-service codes that are very value-based oriented, that are the remote patient monitoring, type of codes, the CCM program. You know, so th there's this interesting, weird place we're in where there's some value-based care and some fee-for-service that's kind of value-based care as well. So I, I think the evolution of that will be interesting versus the ACOs or, or other you know, real value-based care initiatives. Uh, Pete, what do you think? You know, how do you see this evolving and, and how are we going to pay for this, right? I mean, that is the question. <laughs> and the question I've asked some people is like, do we have to have value-based care to do this properly or yeah. can we do it today? <laughs> well, the way I look at it, it's common sense. We've known this, like Gail said, we've been working on this for probably 10 years and we really haven't seen the needle move very far. We've seen a lot of heaviness from the EHR vendors but they have notoriously not done the best job at virtual care. They're doing better, they have apps, but the feedback we're hearing from some of the customers are that they really need an immersive environment, a complete environment, and the EHRs weren't built for that. They were more claims processing billing. So what you're looking at now is a emergence of technology, and it's the free market, right? Demand is at its all-time high for healing, not just care, healing, that's a new term, that's coming from this whole thing. People want to be healed. There's a demand. Where is the technology? It's coming to the surface. It's coming together in order to provide a better outcome for the patient. And it starts like with Gail, what Gail said is, we have to meet the patient where they are in the moment of care. Behavioral health is a great example. You're feeling depressed, something's coming on, you want to push a button and get someone to talk to. That's it. Sometimes it's just as simple as opening up a communication channel and you save that person from something else they might be doing or thinking about. This is reduction of cost if you look at it from a business standpoint. So it's common sense to prevent care. It's like the commercial, pay me now or pay me later. Everybody gets it now. I think even with COVID, has it opened up the can a little further that they're not gonna be able to put the genie back in the bottle? Is that you really need to build systems and put it on the front line, put it in the patient's hand, make them feel like they own their care, and give them the resources through that component into the system and give them access to the data, to their data, let them share it, 
and also uh, let them engage with the physicians that they feel are appropriate and see the pricing. All of this is part of a free market approach. And I really believe right now the system it is poised, very poignantly poised to flip on its head. And there's technology available today that's going to help make that happen. And we're seeing it every day. There's always been new devices coming out on the market, but they didn't have a home. They didn't have plumbing that put it into the clinical workflow to allow you to get the clinical documentation so you could bill for it and get reimbursed. Those solutions are now available. We're one of them. We don't claim we'll be the only one. There'll be others because the demand is there. And you can now have an ecosystem that the patient now feels they have a lot more control in. And when you look at the plans at the highest level, my vision is that the plans are now getting into it. They're rolling up their sleeves. A year ago, they were saying, no, we're not going to deal with this for another year or two. Um, and uh, that was at the AHIP con conference I was at in Nashville last year. And now it's accelerated. Now you talk to them and saying, we're now thinking about it. Because if we can get control of our costs from the top down, we really are going to move the needle dramatically all the way down to the patient. And now we can see the patient almost in real time. Because if they're connected to devices, say standard issue, give them a few devices when you're 65. That's where your highest costs are. Monitor them. Put that in place. Provide the proper plans to reimburse or to pay the entities. And now you've got the ability to track them when they're home. So, you know, cost reduction, preventative care. It's built in. And John, can I, can, can I add something to that just really quickly? Right. Yeah, Jamie, let me just throw in. Uh, Hassan yeah. also asked, how do how do we pay for it and decouple it from MD-centered value-based care? So, yeah, we can throw that into the, the thinking as well. But go ahead, Jamie. <laughs> oh, I, was say, I, I, want, I want Gail to handle that one. Um, yeah, we'll throw that just, to Gail. Just after. really quickly, just to finish off what kind of Pete said and build on something that David said. The digital transformation of healthcare has just been accelerated. And if you take a look at closed systems like Kaiser or like the VA, right? Those systems are already doing over 50% of their care with some form of telemedicine. That might be email, it might be chat, it might be video, whatever it may be. But they have the ability to do that and offer that as a service because their compensation model, it's not a separately compensated service. It's part of how they care for their patient population. And that is a key differentiator between them and the rest of the market, who currently is still, you know, to Gail's point, struggling with this fee-for-service-to-value transition, right? So from my standpoint, it's, it's pretty incredible to watch what you know what can be accomplished when it, this technology is just part of a broader continuum of care, right? And I think that's really the main message here is, is telemedicine a panacea? No, it's not. It is another tool in a tool belt that can be used to you know, go visit patients where they are in their home, in their workplace, on the side of a mountain somewhere, wherever it may be. Um, but it really allows them to get care on their term. And it's better for the provider too, because it allows the provider with asynchronous standpoint to time shift care. They can sit there and batch go through patients at the end of their shift and focus on the patients who are in their office instead of being disturbed uh, constantly with everything that's going on. So for me, this is about process and workflow and how you change that behavior. And when it comes to compensation and, you know, provider stuff, you know, I'm, I'm definitely turning it over to Gail for that one. <laughs> yeah, so let's have I Gail. She's, uh, chopping, she's chopping at the bit. <laughs> Although, Jenny, no, I think you China... did, like the quotable line the, that, that telehealth and virtual care are part of the continuum of care. Like, I love that. I mean, how do I write my title's continuum of care, and yet this is completely in what I do, and I haven't heard many people say it, so thank you. It was, um, you know, what's interesting with money is that the change had happened before COVID. Right, CMS was working on remote patient monitoring codes after AMA, the American Medical Association, did for a year and a half ago, and they were working on chronic care management tie-ins to that for remote patient monitoring and telehealth. The interstate compacting had already started. Um, it just it got accelerated, but CMS has been leading on this. In fact, all of us who were paying attention, it they announced the final at Thanksgiving of last year, and it went into effect January 1st. So I think, so it's really interesting, right? We get, it's done in 20 minute increments. So I think that it's almost on the line between fee for service and value. It's not a bundle, it's a tie. It doesn't say that we're doing that based on a diagnosis. 
then it's added to the payment if you do have a chronic care diagnosis like diabetes or cardiovascular, then the provider gets paid more. So they're incentivized to keep in touch with the patient and provide better care, keep them out of the hospital longer, right? So, and then on top of it, these, these patients um, have started using it more because it was it, they were needed, but we were already being paid for it. Where the changes have happened and really changed and where we'll have to see what happens is in some of the loosening of the ties on telehealth. But for those of us who have been around the past year or two, we have had to say, how will this be funded both in a fee-for-service and value, because we haven't known how it would get built, and anything in between, a shared risk, a um, a contract. I think we're going to see a lot more of payer contracts. If you want to follow the money and how this is paid, payers, I think, during COVID had the opportunity to see that this is cost-effective quality care. When we look at what, removing the restriction on how it's delivered to the fact that it is delivered. And so I think what we're going to see a rapid change on is payers who say, you know, I really care about the health of my chronic care patients, regardless of age, and I want to see them stay out of the hospital and have better health and better outcomes. And cardiovascular is over 40% are returned to the hospital within 30 days of an episode. Over 40%. So value turned that down a bit, but I think value turned it down not because of the payment structure, but because of the fact that they looked at continuum of care. So regardless of what happens, I think that CMS has set it up so that that payment is going to continue 100%. And since that's going to continue, a lot of this is definitely here to stay. Okay, was that quick enough? That's awesome. Well, and you know, Gail's easy yeah, to find on Twitter if you want to dive deep. Right, <laughs> Go ahead, Dave. You can. <laughs> I'm always up for time. Yeah. So we've spent we've spent a lot of time looking at what what you know what do you give someone to go uh, for congestive heart failure? They come in, there's a protocol, lots of tests. What do they take home? Spiriometer and a scale. It's a good place to start, um, and that can do a tremendous amount of uh, have a tremendous impact. But the guess the question is when they do come back or if they do, is there an encounter to you know to go through that with them? instead of them just calling the ambulance or the home health nurse, there's a way uh, to kind of gather data, a longitudinal view of how they feel. Um, and I, I think it comes down to a fairly simple app. So those things I think will become very disruptive to the network and the resources provided. When you look at chronic care and cardio specialty and who's expected to be there when they come back and how do you keep them coming back again. So that's a, you know, it's a profile. Uh, maybe polychronic, and that's a little difficult to manage, and that takes risk scoring and more analytics. Um, but I like when we drill in, we talk about cardiac and discharge criteria um, for congestive heart failure, because that's one you can just nail. Um, there's there's other things that are more that are tougher. So I have epilepsy. I I get an, an issue with compliance and medication. It's handled very well by uh, CVS, Caremark, you know, the P PBMs working my employer to make sure I get my right drugs, come in pill packs. I have another component, which is sleep, uh, sleep apnea, um, and I have a device to do that. And it's a right click away from my sleep health doctor, who is also my neurologist. And when I go and see her in Epic, she right clicks, she good scores, bad scores. I have personal devices, let me Fitbit can do so many things now. The, the hardest one is really stressed and how you're engaged professionally uh, in your uptime. And that's the diff most difficult one to manage. And so when talking to my neurologist about that, who has a panel of 200 patients, any 12, you know, he's engaged with over two-week period, he says, this is one of the toughest things for specialty care, for, for patients that can have high efficacy treatments. Who's, I need the lab tests from how those medications are working in your blood. I've got to see that because we have to constantly balance those out. Um, we need to have a conversation and it's got, you know, it goes back and looking over your shoulder and what you've experienced. And so from his standpoint, telehealth is not going to work for those 12 people that he needs to be engaged with um, over some period of time is kind of a cycle. And then there's the frequent callers and frequent providers. 
Telehealth is very disruptive as practice, but it's very helpful when he when you can he can access in the MR um, and see how my sleep is or when I bring in and show him the app on my Fitbit. So chronic conditions, cardiology, uh, some neurological conditions where you can self monitor. Those I think are very important. Big question is uh, is does that data go into Epic? Is it because pers personally generated? Data? Uh, who's responsible for screening it, and this is really where the industry is headed more to it's the concept of a digital twin, where you're, they're con constantly going through data and surfacing things up, and you have really a call center kind of environment or alerts on apps. Um, so these are exciting things to me. One element of it is there's going to be big big groups of companies and, and people who do, I do MDVIP, I pay retail for things, and the lab's right down the street. But getting those tests done is a, could be a real big problem. Yeah, and I, you know, let's continue with that conversation, David, because you bring up some great points about how do we really engage the patient in the most effective way possible? Is it email? Is it text? Is it devices shipped from the home? I thought it was fascinating in one of uh, my discussions with Dell, uh, I don't know, it was last month or so, you guys said something, we're really great at shipping devices to home. And I, I'd never thought about it from that way because, you know, there is a lot of discussion like, oh, there's a lot of great wearable devices that monitor uh, different clinical uh, signs. But, you know, how do we get them there and how, how do we deliver that? Um, so, you know, I think there's a balance, obviously, that we can have this discussion around do we need a device? Do we just need the cell phone? What, what, what's your approach, Steve, on how do you engage the patient? it in the most effective way possible? Uh, well, the way I look at it, um, you have to have first the patient in mind and you have to know what the patient will accept. So that's a conversation between the physician and the patient to know what's right. Their chronic disease uh, structure, um, their, their social uh, situation, do they have a caregiver? All of those factor into the decision as to how you're going to engage that patient to take better care of themselves because First, you want them to care for themselves, surround themselves with caregivers. That's driving costs out of the system, if you will. And then you want to make sure that the clinical connections are there. So now you've assessed the patient. You have to know uh, if they could use an app, that's great. You give them an app. If not, then they probably have some caregiver do it for them. Once the data determinants are made, what kind of data you need, you can deploy devices. So you select the devices you want. And as you know, the business problem there, uh, which we've taken a crack at solving with our solution, is that all of these different devices are all coming out on the market, maybe hundreds of them a month, best of breed or emerging every month as a new best of breed. And they all speak a different language. They may have a different protocol. They may have a different way. They're not. Some of them are secure. Some of them are not. Some of them are cleared. Some of them are not. You need a, a way to consolidate all of that information, make it normalized and actionable and compare it to thresholds and then do that all virtually and inform the clinicians. So this system that I just talked about is something that we took a crack at. I think we've got a great solution, but there are going to be others that try to attract, attack that problem because that's the real crux of it. You need to be able to virtualize the data that's coming from the patient, compare it to the prescribed norms or um, you know, some patients run hot. So you might have a blood pressure running, uh, running differently than another patient. But you set the limits and the limits determine your notifications. Now you've got a link to the patient at the home and when something happens, you can determine how to engage that patient. And it should be all of the above, depending on what that patient's situation is. It could be a phone call. Um, I like Jamie's example. I'm gonna use that for the commercial. It's the guy on the side of the mountain that makes the phone call and he needs care right now, I think that's a great visual because that's really where we're at. We have the technology to do it. Uh, even without 5G, there's coverage pretty much everywhere now. So the reality is no matter where you are, no matter who you are, no matter what disease structure you have, there is a way to provide better care. It all comes down to how do you get reimbursed. Medicaid's, Medicare is taking a crack at it. The plans are gonna come in. And like Gail had said, they have to because this is just common sense. They see the opportunity. And there is technology available today that will surface that information in a solid virtual care workflow. And that's the other key. It has to be in workflow. And then bring it to the EHRs. When you bring it home, everybody checks the box. And ultimately, uh, you have access to the data. Every patient has access to it. 
the physicians have access to it, and you all can view it at your own time and in your own, um, in your own uh, emotional feeling about that data. Do I feel good about it or bad about it? And you can take action on all modes of communication and document it. It has to be documented in order to get paid. Definitely. And I love the idea of personalizing the care to the patient, but also to the provider or the specialty or all of those things. Uh, and I think that's what's killed a lot of the solutions in the past is that it wasn't personalized. Jamie, I, I think there's an interesting angle from your perspective. I mean, you blew me away saying that you have 10,000 devices across healthcare organizations. It's interesting how, you know, we've largely talked about virtual care at home, but it feels like virtual care at a hospital or healthcare organization is a feature today as well with your telequarantine solution, you know, and, and then I think there is an interesting layer and maybe you could even talk a little bit about it around the, the language barrier as well. Cause I think, you know, we, we think, oh, we just send an engagement and when we send the engagement in English and they can't read it, that's not very helpful. Right. So, you know, what's your take kind of on, you know, maybe you can add in the provider perspective, uh, you know, and, and how do we engage the patient, whether they're in the hospital or in the home and maybe even add the language because you have some expertise there as well. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I think there are a few things at play here. One, healthcare traditionally has not taken a solution-oriented approach to solving the problems that are in front of us. It's been like, hey, we have this technology, let's deploy it. Or someone's come and said, I've got a great thing that does X and it's deployed for that, whether it's needed or not. And I think what we've seen, actually, I've seen it over the last two or three months, it's been pretty incredible is healthcare systems innovating in a different way than they have in the past, which is really saying, what's the problem we're trying to solve? Let's frame the problem. And instead of saying, this is the technology we have, let's amass the right technologies to solve that specific issue. And by the way, instead of throwing a technology at it, can we not do this with you know, bringing the person in? Is there an in-person visit that solves it better? Or is a phone call, I know we can do it over video, but is the phone call a better way to handle this, right? And so I, t I think we tend to over-engineer solutions a lot. And I think keeping it simple and taking a much more problem-solving oriented approach or a design thinking approach, if you will, which is you know, probably still only deployed in five or 10% of healthcare systems across the country, right there. It, it's not something that's been really prevalent. And I think once we do that and you frame the problem right, you can now come up with what the right solution is to that problem. And the types of devices, they're all gonna be very use case specific, right? So telepsychiatry needs a dif different solution than telestroke needs, which needs a different solution than teleurology. And while they can use similar technologies, to Pete's point, the, the workflow is completely different. And I think what we need to start doing when we're putting technology solutions in place is to really mold them to the way that people work instead of asking the people to mold to the technology. And I think that's just a fundamental shift that I've seen happening over the course of the last few months. We've collaborated now with 25 different healthcare systems on the telequarantine solution. And what used to be a year long process We've now been in, be able to innovate in two or three months and they've been giving us feedback. If it wasn't perfect, they were okay with that because it was more of like a, a Facebook move fast and break things type of environment and they just needed a solution now. Um, I think over time, you know, to Pete's point again and to David, there's gonna be a shakeout in a lot of the solutions that are in market. People that are using FaceTime can't continue to use FaceTime to, to solve their telemedicine needs. You need to have an enterprise strategy when it comes to these telemedicine solutions. So you know, with language services in the home, you know, one in five patients speaks a language primarily other than English in their home. And as a result, if you don't have a language interpretation integration, you're ignoring 20% of the population. And for, and that's, by the way, a generalization across the United States. So to the degree that there are people, you know, there are refugee settlement areas in some of our nation's biggest and smallest cities. If you take a look at a, a city like Columbus, Ohio, where our company was founded, there are 126 different languages spoken. And if I asked you all to guess what the top language is, I'm sure you would be wrong because it's Somali. Right. Oh, I think wow. we all would have gone with like Spanish or maybe even Arabic. Right. But it's, it's Somali. So, you know, when we take a look at this um, and trying to figure out what you do with these patient populations, we actually have a lot of amazing data tied up in our platform that we've never unlocked on population health of, um, you know, these folks who speak other languages and are different ethnicities in our country and how we can help actually resolve those types of situations. So, um, you know, for me, it's about 
God, let's let's really take a look at the problem that we're solving and mold the technology to fit it. And then let's forget, let's not forget that a lot of the population doesn't speak English and how are you going to solve those disparities? The other thing that I'll note is typically in telemedicine, there's a rural versus urban argument, right? And people always talk about how telemedicine can really help solve a lot of what happens in rural America. But the fact of the matter is, and a lot of people don't realize this, in our nation's cities, there's, you know, there are some of the biggest medical deserts that exist because in LA as an example, not everyone gets to go to UCLA and Cedars. You know, these Taj Mahal hospitals that are out there, they're dealing with smaller community hospitals in their local area. And those hospitals might not be able to staff a neurologist. They may not be able to staff a psychiatrist. So how do we deliver those services to those underserved communities? You can beam them in over telemedicine, leave the patient in their community where all the studies have shown that if you leave them within their own care network, they're much more likely to have a good outcome uh, than if you transfer them to a higher level of care outside of their community where their family can't visit them, where they're not familiar with some of the customs of what it might be. So I think there's a lot at play there. Yeah, thanks, Jamie. And uh... Unfortunately, I think we made a mistake. We should have scheduled this for at least three hours uh, you know, to, to be able to cover everything that we wanted to cover. But, uh, you know, unfortunately, we're, we're at time. David, you want to give us some final thoughts and we'll wrap this up? Yeah, I've been it's great panel. I've been thinking through this a little bit and it, to me it comes from a generational aspect. We really I think need to think through the upcoming uh cohorts of patients, I mean of uh, physicians and look at this 2-3 years out and see if there's some way to stratify interests of of medical students, medical learning to engage in a very chaotic time where they are not going to a facility necessary to learn how how to, you know, uh, learn more about medicine and specializations, but they may become more generalists and opportunistics, leading into you know what we call the gig economy. There's just something there um, around familiar with the device and kind of the you know what we talked about demographic uh, you know challenges and things like that. So that's that's what I'm thinking coming out of this. Awesome. Thanks so much to all of you and. Thanks for everyone who watched live or recorded. Uh, we, you know, I appreciate our, our host Dell Technologies for sponsoring this meetup and making and putting it all together together with us at Healthcare IT Today. If you want to find the recording, we'll be emailing it out to anyone that's registered, so you can check all the recording out. You can share it. Of course, you can follow along on Twitter the hashtag, and of course, we'll post it to healthcareidtoday.com. Thanks everyone for participating. Have a great day.